Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is the strategic world in which we live. A big question for us is how can we predict and explain outcomes in international relations? And as you'll remember from a couple of videos ago, the problem with answering this question is that the international realm is anarchic, and therefore anything can happen. So how do we narrow our expectations? Well, the solution to this problem is to analyze actors' abilities and desires to find plausible outcomes, to reduce the realm of expectations from anything to just a few plausible things. And you can see this is easy to do in one sense, because like, you know, the United States has a lot of nuclear weapons. The United States could fire the nuclear weapons on itself. There's nothing stopping that from happening in the anarchic world. But if that were to happen, the United States would be destroyed, and the United States wouldn't be happy about that. So that's something that's not desirable for the United States, and so the United States doesn't do it. Likewise, the United States doesn't fire its nuclear weapons at Russia because Russia has nuclear weapons that it would fire back in the United States. The United States doesn't want to kill itself, and so the United States doesn't fire its weapons at Russia. Again, we've reduced a possible outcome to not being plausible, and so we've eliminated that. But when we try to go down further and deeper into this world of strategic interaction, we quickly hit a wall, and this is why. The world is strategic. There are about 200 states out there, and how state one acts affects state two's outcomes, and how state two acts affects state one's outcomes, and how state one acts affects state, three out state three's outcomes, and so forth. So bottom line, states are strategically interdependent. What one does affects the outcomes of everybody else, and what everyone else does affects the outcomes of that first state. And so if we're interested in explaining and predicting international relations, we need to somehow aggregate all of those strategies together and figure out what is going to happen when there are all of these moving parts going on and all of them are trying to figure out what everyone else is doing. And it's quite apparent that states, in a practical sense, are worried about these things too. It's not just us as international relations scholars. States know that they're strategically interdependent. And the proof here is just looking at the United States' intelligence budget. At the United States' intelligence budget. If the United States didn't care about strategic interdependence, they would not be spending so much money on the intelligence community. The intelligence community's goal is to figure out what everyone else is doing so the United States can tailor its strategy accordingly. The United States is not just acting blindly as though it's the only state in the world. It's tailoring its strategies and its plans of action according to what everyone else is doing. And everyone else in the world is doing the same thing. It's just that the United States is much better at it because the United States has a much larger intelligence budget. Now, what would be really terrific for us as scholars of international relations is if there were a scientific way to study strategic interdependence. That would save us a lot of time and, oh yeah, that's right, there is such a thing. It's called game theory. Game theory is the scientific study of strategic interdependence. Bam. Done. Great. This is sounding like a tool that we'll want to use going forward, and in fact, we will be using it going forward. Now, game theory was originally developed in the 1950s to study economic interactions, such as how Coca-Cola's advertising campaign affects Pepsi's outcomes and so forth. And while that was an economic application, these sorts of tools work just as well for state-level behavior, because these things are strategic, st uh, strategically interdependent just as how firms act in an economic world. Now, some caveats here. Game theory is not black magic. If you open up a book on international relations that has a game theoretical slant to it, you will often find that the author doesn't really actually get into the game theory and sort of talks around it as though he's bringing something special to the table that no one else can, and you're just not smart enough to be able to understand it yourself, so we're not even going to talk about it. That's absolutely crap, and we're not going to be doing that. We are going to actually be doing the game theory. It is your responsibility as someone who is studying this, to understand what's going on. We are not going to be talking around the subject. We are actually going to be doing it. You are going to see that these things are not some bizarre little thing going on in the background that you know you shouldn't pay attention to because it's behind the curtain. In fact, we want you to be able to understand, understand these things because everything that we're going to be saying is going to be based off of these game, theor game theoretical results. And so if you don't understand what's going on in the models, there's no point in doing the game theory. So we're going to be really upfront and clear about what's going on in these game theoretical models that we'll be creating. It's worth noting that game theory does not capture all elements of reality. Game theory creates models and figures out what's smart and rational for everyone in those models to do, given their situations. But at the end of the day, a model is a model. It is not reality. It makes simplifying assumptions. And we're going to be making these simplifying assumptions all the time when we use game theory. So be aware of the fact that what we're going to be doing is not looking at exactly what the real world looks like. We're going to be taking some abstractions away to look at how key critical parts of reality affect outcomes. Lastly, 
Game theory cannot tell us something that a super smart human being does not already know. And the reason for that is that all game theory really does is map assumptions to logically valid conclusions. And the real benefit to using game theory, and the reason why international relations scholars sort of moved away from informal arguments or theories that only use words exclusively, uh, this has happened a couple of decades ago, is that when you use these informal arguments, you sometimes get logically invalid conclusions and you don't even realize it because the the language of, of English is really imprecise, unlike mathematics. And so when we use mathematical models, these game theoretical models, we can demonstrate errors in reasoning formally by using math. Or on the other hand, if there are no errors in the model, then we can prove that our logic is sound or it's, it's valid, I should say. So the recipe going forward is going to look like this. We're going to create some assumptions. That's the first step. We need to essentially gather the things that we want to talk about and make assumptions accordingly. And then once we have those assumptions, we're going to do math. That's the game theory part. And that step two is going to get us to step three, which is to reach valid, logically valid conclusions. And that's what we're really looking for, is to make sure that we have some internal validity into our arguments. Now, there are some pitfalls that we'll see along the way here, and that's... First, if our assumptions are silly, our conclusions might also be silly. So remember here, this is all just a process, right? So step one is creating all of these other things. So we take our assumptions. The game theory doesn't do anything special. It just does math. That's why it's step two, do some math. So if we have bad assumptions at the beginning, the math is not going to fix those bad assumptions. And we'll end up reaching logically valid conclusions, but they might very well be silly logically valid conclusions because the assumptions were, were silly. So our results are only as good as the assumptions that we put into the model. Now, on the flip side of things, if our assumptions are way too open and way too liberal, then we'll have this huge, huge model and we won't be able to do the math because it's just going to be so complicated. And so the the goal is to find a middle ground. So we need to find something that is close enough to reality that the assumptions don't look really silly, but not too full and too open. Otherwise, we won't be able to do the math. So we need to find a middle ground going forward. And that actually wraps up this video and actually finishes the first chapter, the introduction to international relations. And starting in the next video, we will be focusing on models of conflict and cooperation, just overarching co conflict and cooperation models to see if in a world of anarchy, we can actually cooperate with one another, given the fact that there's actually no one enforcing that cooperation. There's no police force. So I hope you join me then. It'll be a little bit more exciting because we'll actually be getting into game theoretical models at that point. And until then, I hope you take care and I'll see you later. Bye.